So, the topic of today's lecture is the effect of electron configuration, electron pairs, chemical bonds on molecular geometry. So what we already know is that molecules are created from groupings of atoms held together by pairs of electrons. This is Gilbert Lewis's model. And we learn how to create representations of molecules and their bonding by using Lewis dot structures. So we're going to start, to illustrate this idea, we're going to start by working with three molecules we've already looked at. Methane, CH4, ammonia, NH3, and water, H2O. So while I'm doing this on the board, I would like all of you to be doing this on paper just for practice. So to create our Lewis dot structures, we need to draw first the central atom with its valence or outermost electrons arranged on the sides of an imaginary square. One electron to a side until you reach a point where you have five or more electrons, in which case you have to start doubling them up. So specific example, here's carbon, four valence electrons, we would draw carbon like this. Nitrogen has five valence electrons, so here are the first four. Now we have to start doubling them up. Doesn't matter which side you double them up on. And finally, oxygen has six valence electrons. Now, Lewis's theory, and it has been well documented, thousands of experiments to show this, is that chemical bonds between atoms are composed of pairs of electrons, shared pairs of electrons. So let's bring in the hydrogens, and as I mentioned before, you can either color code the electrons on each atom so that we know which atom is contributing which electrons, or shape code them with X's and circles. So hydrogen, having only one unpaired electron, makes only one bond. Carbon, since it has four unpaired electrons in its valence shell, makes four bonds. NH3, we do the same thing, create the bonds between the nitrogen and the hydrogen. And finally, with oxygen, we have two hydrogens bonded to the oxygen and water. Now, we also converted these dot structures into line structures. So if we play connect the dots, each pair of electrons is represented by a line. So each line is called a chemical bond, a shared pair of electrons. Now here is where we get into today's lecture topic. The way I'm drawing these molecules suggests that in their optimal state, they're flat as a pancake, and the bond angles between each of these carbon hydrogen, nitrogen hydrogen, or oxygen hydrogen bonds are 90 degrees. And this would be fine, except there's a little contradiction here. And that is that molecules don't just exist in two dimensions, they exist in three dimensions. And since pairs of electrons have the same charge, the pairs of electrons, or the lone pair of electrons, will repel each other to try and achieve the maximum distance apart they can in not two-dimensional, but three-dimensional space. So I'm going to take the dot structures off the board here, and we're going to investigate this concept of what the optimal arrangement between these pairs of electrons, whether they are bonding pairs, as illustrated by the lines, or lone pairs, as illustrated by the dots, what those optimum relationships would be. So the question you're asking yourself is, given n groups arranged around a central point, what is the maximum distance apart I can put those groups? So, I've got four groups in each case. 
Just because I have a lone pair doesn't mean that isn't a group, a pair of electrons. I have four atoms in the methane, three atoms in a lone pair in ammonia, two atoms in two lone pairs in water. So the optimal distance apart for all of these groups is not the 90 degree angles you see here, but, and now we're gonna have to challenge your artistic skills with one of the many conventions of representing a three-dimensional structure on a two-dimensional surface, we have to use what's called the wedge and dash convention. So what this wedge is, is a, an electron pair bond coming out of the plane of the screen towards you. The dash represents an electron pair bond going behind the plane of the screen and these ordinary looking bond lines, they represent bonds that are in the plane of the screen. So if we put our hydrogens in, now we have a very different scenario, geometrically speaking. In contrast to the 90 degree bond angles we see here for each of these, the bond angle in this arrangement is 109.5 degrees, a nearly 20 degree increase in the distance between the pairs of electrons. The farther apart you put the pairs of electrons, the weaker the repulsions and the lower the energy of the molecule, the more stable the geometric arrangement is. So since each of these central atoms are bonded to four groups, you're going to have the same initial geometric, that's supposed to be a nitrogen, arrangement of the bonds, and in this case, a lone pair. So we'll put our lone pair on a stick. We do the same thing with the oxygen. Now you have two lone pairs. Put in the hydrogens. And what we have is, again, first approximation is for all of these bond angles, 109.5 degrees apart, substantially larger than the 90 degree bond angles. Now, there's a name for this geometry. In the case of, the, this by the way, is called electronic geometry, where we incorporate all types of electron pairs. There is a type of geometry called molecular geometry that is a subset of electronic geometry, but you must determine electronic geometry first because the lone pairs also have an effect on how the bonds will arrange themselves in three dimensions relative to each other. So the electronic geometry of this shape is called tetrahedral. It's a four-sided pyramid. However, when we describe the molecular geometry of a molecule, we ignore the lone pairs and only name, describe geometrically the relationship between the atoms that are bonded together in the molecule. So in the case of methane, there's no change. You have four atoms attached to the carbon. You don't disregard any of them. So the electronic geometry of the methane is tetrahedral. The molecular geometry of the methane is also tetrahedral. When we come to ammonia though, if we disregard this lone pair, okay, which we have to do to determine the molecular geometry, then what you have left is a three-sided pyramid. So the molecular geometry of ammonia, and notice this is not flat, this is not planar. This is called a trigonal pyramid or trigonal pyramidal geometry. Now when we come to water, again, tetrahedral electronic geometry because you have the two lone pairs plus two hydrogens. You have four groups attached to the oxygen 
They must be arranged in space as far apart as possible. That's tetrahedral. But when we disregard the lone pairs to describe the molecular geometry, what we now get is a shape that is mellifluously described as bent. Some people also call this V-shaped. So the idea, the fundamental principle behind this is you are looking for optimum geometric relationships between pairs of electrons such that these electron pairs are as far apart as possible and arranged as symmetrically as possible. You can envision this another way. If you envision the central atom as being at the center of a sphere and the atoms or lone pairs moving on the surface of a sphere, then you'll get the same result. Okay, so that's the Gillespie model of how to visualize this. Now, I've only talked about one example here, an atom bonded to four groups. But we see that even though the electronic geometry is the same, we have three different molecular geometries. There are five fundamental arrangements of atoms attached to a central atom. So I'm going to show you those now. Let's clear the board here. So again, you're asking yourself the same question over and over, given N groups attached to a central atom, what is the maximum distance apart in space you can arrange those groups? So if you have two atoms attached to a central atom, the farthest distance apart you can create a structure for is 180 degrees. If you bring these atoms closer to expand this angle, this angle becomes less than 180, the repulsion is greater on this side, and so this is the optimum distance apart. So the bond angle here is 180 degrees. So this is true for any compound that has one atom bonded to two groups. You will get a linear arrangement. Now again, we're not distinguishing yet between lone pairs and atoms. We're just talking about groups. When you have a central atom bonded to three groups, now what you get is an arrangement that is representative of the way I like to slice my lemon meringue pie. You have a planar arrangement, still flat, same thing with the first arrangement, all of these atoms are in the same plane. The bond angles here are 120 degrees. So because the molecule is flat, we call it planar. And because there are three groups attached to it, it's like a triangle, trigonal. So this is called trigonal planar geometry. So we see again that the presence of a third pair of electrons, a third bond, causes movement of the other two bonds to this optimum symmetrical arrangement around the central atom. Now we've already talked about the four group scenario, so I'll just draw that in. So again, you want to practice this. And as a reminder, the wedge is coming out at you, the dash is going away from you behind the plane of the board, and the ordinary lines are in the plane of the board. So this arrangement, again, that we've already looked at, is called tetrahedral. Now, one of the things we talked a lot about was something called the octet rule that atoms starting with boron, when they make bonds to other atoms, want to be in contact with eight electrons in their outer shell, either by sharing or having lone pairs or a combination of both. Well, it turns out that larger atoms, when you go down to the next full row of the periodic table, sulfur, phosphorus, and so on, 
Those elements can make more bonds than just four. They can be in contact with 10 or 12 electrons in their outer shell. So the last two geometries of our fundamental geometries involve a central atom attached to five groups. Now this is an example, the only example, of what we would call compound geometry because you don't have identical bond angles. Again, these bond angles, just as a reminder, 109.5 degrees. So we have two what we would call electron domains. We have the axial domain. If you imagine grabbing these two atoms, you can spin the molecule around an axle that goes through the central atom. These bond angles are 90 degrees relative to the atoms in what we would describe as the equator around this molecule. And in fact, these are called equatorial groups. So just like the trigonal planar example, okay, if you stick one coming out of the board and one going behind the board, that would be these guys, the axial guys, these bond angles are 120 degrees. All of these bond angles between the groups that are attached to the central atom in this equator. Now, this is the maximum distance apart you can arrange five groups around a central atom. The last geometry, oh, so this is called, sorry, I almost forgot to name it. This is called a trigonal, because of the three sides, bipyramid. So trigonal bipyramidal geometry. We have two three-sided pyramids.